Now that we've answered the question of why we need decoupling capacitors, let's turn to the question of what size should they be. And remember, for decoupling capacitors, there are two considerations we're trying to we're trying to resolve. Uh, we're trying to make sure there's a charge reservoir in the local environment of the IC, the load, and we're also trying to make sure that there's a lot of filtering going on to filter out the high frequency components. What size capacitor should we have for each consideration? Well, for a charge reservoir, if we look at the equation Q equals CV, we want to make sure we have lots of charge, lots of Q, and so for any given voltage, we would want to maximize C. So this would lead us to wanting a, a large capacitance, a large capacitance there. For filtering, we would want the impedance, which is equal to 1 over J omega C. We want that to be very low uh, at some uh, non-DC frequency. So again, here we want this term, we want the denominator to be maximized, and so we would want C to be large. So we want a large C. Now if you look at these two considerations, they both indicate that we want a large capacitance. So wouldn't we just put the largest capacitor in this circuit that we can? Wouldn't we just use the largest capacitor possible? And the answer is a, a definite, most emphatic no. No, not necessarily. And the reason is it's, it has to do with the package with parasitics and the capacitance. If, if it was an ideal capacitor, if it was a perfect capacitor, then yes, this would be true. You'd want to use the largest capacitance possible. But remember, when you have a capacitor, it, this is what you would hope it looks like, just an ideal circuit, but it doesn't look like that. In fact, it's going to have some, um, some ESL equivalent series inductance. It's going to have some ESR, some equivalent series resistance. It's going to have a parasitic uh, capac uh, resistor across the capacitor, R and C. And this is more what it looks like. And to maximize ca the capacitance, often what you'll find is that it'll come in a very large package. And in fact, for electrolytic capacitors, it may be something that looks like this with leads coming out. And these long leads here, mean that there's going to be a lot of equi equivalent series inductance. And in fact, in general, as the packages get larger, let's say we're looking at a surface mount package like this, there's one side and there's another, and then we had an, another surface mount package that's much larger, this package here would have more ESL and more ESR, this should be an S, equivalent series inductance and equivalent series resistance than this smaller package. So the, the answer really is for a given package size, you want to use the largest capacitance possible. So let's say this was an 0805 package, you would want to use the largest capacitance that can fit in that package, assuming that the ESL hasn't gotten out of control. The competing consideration, which you may remember from earlier, is that you want to make sure you're operating the capacitor below its self-resonant frequency, frequency. And by, in, this, in this I'm talking about the decoupling capacitor that's sitting right next to the load. So if you remember, we had log, we, we have this plot here where we have log of frequency on the x-axis and log of impedance on the y-axis. And as you come down, 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 as you go up in frequency, that, that's going to be the case until you hit the resonant frequency, which is 1 over the square root of LC, and then it's going to start looking more inductive as you go up. And so the decoupling capacitor, the local decoupling capacitor that's sitting right next to your load, you want to be operating in this regime here. So you may want to pick a, a, a small capacitor to push this point out further. Okay, so it's, I, I hope I've, I've gotten the point across that it's too simple to ask what size should the, how large should the capacitor be, what size it is. Um, but I'm going to scroll down and write three interrelated questions, and I'm going to try to answer them all to, to come up with the size and placement and so on. Let's broaden the question. Instead of asking only what size should the capacitor be, the decoupling capacitor, let's ask three interrelated questions. One, what size should it be? Two, how many should we have? And three, where should we put them? And these answer, the answer to these questions all flow into one another. Um, so it, you're not exactly answering each one independently, but I'm going to try as best I can to answer them independently. Well, before we start, let's go ahead and draw what a typical solution has been in the past to decoupling. I'm going to pause and do that. Typically, what's done in the broad sense is that you would include a 
one or, or several bulk de decoupling capacitors near the power supply, this plus 5 volt power supply in this case, and, and here I've drawn it. This is a, a 10 microfarad capacitor, so it's a rather beefy capacitor. Uh, this would be located physically near the power supply. And then you go out into your circuit, out into the printed circuit board, and near the load, near the IC, amplifier, microcontroller, or whatever, you would put a local decoupling capacitor. And, and you might include more than one, uh, not just one, but they would be much smaller than these bulk decoupling capacitors and on the order of about 0 0.1 microfarad. And one thing I want to note when I'm calling this bulk and this local decoupling, decoup, they're all capacitors. They're all going to come maybe in the same um, uh, surface mount package. All, I, all, I, all I'm trying to do here is follow the nomenclature that a lot of people use where the big ones that you put near the power supply are often called the bulk uh, capacitors and the ones you put near the load are called the local decoupling capacitors or the decoupling capacitors or something like that. It's kind of an artificial distinction between these two, but that's how a lot of people talk about them. Okay, so you have this 10 microfarad capacitor near the source and the 0.1 microfarad capacitor near the load, and this is what people have traditionally done or something very similar to this. Why would you not do this? Well, this approach breaks down when you get into designs of the hundred of me hundreds of megahertz. So it breaks down when you get into the hundreds of megahertz or when the system has large current draws at transitions. Uh, large current draws. Current draws, which can upset the system, uh, upset other loads. Or when the load um, can't tolerate uh, a lot of voltage r ripple. So low toleration duration of ripple. And that's becoming more and more the case as systems are operating at lower and lower voltages, they can tolerate less and less voltage ripple. Now hopefully this is clear. This here is what's traditionally done. Um, and I'm going to now proceed to answer these three questions in order, starting with what size. Let me scroll down and draw something for for the size. Let me scroll down here. Here I've drawn an inverter circuit. Here, there's the PMOS and an NMOS, which is charging and discharging a capacitive load, which I've labeled C sub L. Now at the transition, what what do we know about the circuit and where will it draw current? Well, it'll draw current in and, and need charge for two things. The first thing is the charging of CL, charging CL. And the second thing will be shoot through current. Shoot through, uh, well, current. Shoot through current. For charging CL, you're going to need to pull charge in and then eventually drain it away, or actually drain it out this way. And the shoot through current comes from when both transistors in, w during the transition region, both of them are, are slightly on and so some current is drawn through both transistors to ground. What will this look like as a function of time and frequency? As a function of time, what's going to happen is some, you're coming in here, you're in a steady state, let's say you're in a low state and you want to switch to a high state, you'll, you'll see a current draw that comes up in time, reaches a peak and then comes down kind of in a triangular formation and then sometime later when it transitions state again you'll see the same. And in between those two transitions it draws no, basically no current here. I mean there may be some quiescent current but not a whole lot. And what do we have here? This time here is the rise time, T sub R, and this time here is the period, uh, maybe the circuit's operating at 100 megahertz or whatever and that's, that's that, fear, that, that frequency. Now, if we go over and take the Fourier transform of it, uh, with the here we have the log of the current on the y-axis and the log of the frequency on the x-axis. What's going to happen is you come out in some frequency and then you roll off. And this is a little bit of a digression, but it's an interesting point. So you'll have frequency components here and some more down here. And this corner frequency here is f equals 1 over pi times the, the rise time. And that's why these high frequency components are associated with the rise time. Now let's say we either modeled the circuit, modeled the system, or we dug into the data sheets and found parameters related to it. And let's say we know this peak current here. This is what I care about. This peak current I. 
I, I there. So let me scroll down. How would we go about deciding the size of our decoupling capacitor? Well, let's go back to this fundamental equation of Q equals CV. And let's take the derivative of it. So dQ dt is nothing more than current equals C dV dt. And let's rearrange this so that we have C equals I times dt over dV. And let's, let me write this out in a little bit different form. We have the transient current, transient, which is this guy here, that's this one here, times the uh, transition time, which is this TR, let's say that's what it is, over the voltage, and this is, we're going to call it a max voltage, max ripple, max ripple the maximum ripple we can stand. And we would look at our circuit uh, and decide, given this, given this transient, given the, our operating frequency, what sort of voltage can we tolerate in, in this system before it changes states uncontrollably or undesirably? And we would plug all that in and then determine what kind of capacitance we might need. Let me run through a quick example. Let's scroll down. Let's say we looked in the data sheets and at the transition, the circuit we're, we're trying to decouple from the rest of the system it draws 0.1 amps. Let's say its rise time is one microsecond and the maximum voltage ripple we can tolerate is 100 millivolts. We would plug that in, so C equals 0.1 amps times 10 to the minus 6 seconds over 0 0.1 volts equals 1 microfarad. And so you would need, in this, in this case for these variables, at least this much capacitance to decouple your load, your integrated circuit, from the rest of the system.